Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me. Great to have you along and you are most welcome as always. So today, as promised recently, I said I was going to um, commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Matchbox Model Kit Company, which was part of the Lesney Matchbox Group um, and they set up in 1972, so 50th anniversary this year. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to do some, these are fairly short videos, I think I'm not going to have too long, but um, I'll probably do three actually and uh, calling it the magic of Matchbox. And I want, to, I want to start off by talking about, I've got a collection obviously here, of just a selection, uh, and I'll do three videos with different ones in the, in the video. Uh, I'm not going to go doing a review, and I mean, you've, all these have been reviewed, you can go back in the, the channel there and have a look at any one of these, they've all been reviewed, every one of them. But, um, I wanted to talk about what it is about Matchbox that makes them so incredibly popular. Um, because there is a real, it's not just me, <laughs> there's a real passion I notice with lots of other people that really love these kits and uh, when I mentioned it the other week that I was going to be doing this, it's, I was actually quite surprised by in the comments. Several people said, oh yeah, I'm really looking forward to that, I can't wait, that was part of my childhood. Um, and I think it is, um, there's a certain sort of generation of uh, boys and girls, boys in particular, who have brought, been grown up with these things and, um, and I think it has formed definitely one of those sort of positive elements of the childhoods of, of all of us uh, and it's nice to revisit it really um, and sort of try and get our heads around for those of you that, that aren't very interested in it or uh, I know a lot of people sort of um, find elements of it attractive but don't like the kits because they don't think they're very detailed or they're softly moulded and all this kind of thing some of which is very true but what they don't really get why people love it so much people like me um, so I thought we'd delve into that and try and take you back, especially those that are younger and weren't around the first time, so to speak, <laughs> uh, and don't understand the attraction of, uh, of these old kits, uh, as they are now. What you have to remember is the sort of, um, the landscape, as it were, of the, of the model kit availability market back in 1972. Certainly in the UK you had people like Airfix and Frog. Uh, Revell were there, but in a smaller way. They weren't as, they weren't as big as they are today, as a market share. Uh, and there were others, you know, Monogram and um, uh, some of the American uh, manufacturers, I'm trying to think of the, um, I mean AMT ended up as part of the Matchbox deal, they got together with Matchbox, part of the Lesney Agreement, but um, those really were the, the major ones that you found, Tamiya were there as well, more on armour, and they were very expensive, relatively speaking, at, at that time, and they were, they were very much seen as a little bit unattainable for some of us, I think. Um, and so, obviously, the, the guys at Lesney um, came into the market and had a look at what was currently available. And I think they genuinely did see a, a gap in the market and a niche that they could fill by doing things a bit differently, which is certainly what they did. So I think the, the main sort of um, need, if you like, the criticism that people felt when they looked at what was available was the fact that kit market was very austere. Uh, the kits looked austere. Some of them had quite austere artwork. The packaging was austere with very plain boxes and um, they weren't overly exciting to look at and didn't have massive shelf appeal, quite a lot of them. Now in fairness to Airfix they probably were the closest to what Matchbox created in terms of the artworks. They had Roy Cross the artist who was very good, very good indeed. Um, but they often didn't, I think, personally, I don't think they maximised or took full advantage of his skill. Because they would have these box designs where they would have a bit of his artwork and then they'd kind of trim a lot of it off and have the Airfix logo overly uh, prominent within the... Uh, and you've seen this, when, if you look at the Harriers uh, video, where I compare it with the 1968 Harrier kit, 72nd scale GR1. And they, they sort of trimmed back, they had some great artwork, but they didn't always maximise its potential, and, and Matchbox certainly corrected that. Um, they got Roy Huxley to do most of their work, and a guy called, um, another guy called Post. Um, I always forget his Christian name, I'm afraid, is it David or Dan? I can't remember. Um, apologies. But it was mainly Roy Huxley who did all the artwork, and we've talked about this in the, uh, the Matchbox art book, which I recently got for Christmas, and I did a review a few weeks ago. Uh, so we kind of kind of covered that. We talked about the uh, the development of the artwork, how they went from, for example, 
full images, um, which really were very striking and very colourful, as you can see. Let's bring you in on this. Uh, whoops. Um, and then they later went to this more pared down style of image, um, which didn't really have the same impact. And this is before they de violenced them, you know. Uh, and if you look over here, I'll give you an example right behind me. This is the Tomcat, which again, they have, you can always tell when they've changed them because they have this white area, and that's a sure sign that it's the second generation artwork. Um, it is, in fact, still the same um, painting, but they've just gone and put this whitewash over it. And Roy Huxley was quite irritated, he had to keep amending them and de violencing them and all this. And there's no violence in this particular one anyway, but they're just flying over the carriers. But in the, in the others, they have to take out the bomb shells drop in and, and the gunfire and the flames. Another classic example is this one, the, um, the Heinkel 111. And I talked about this in some depth on my review of this kit. This is the original, absolute original Mark 1 box from 1976. And this one, 75 actually, might be 75. Let's just see, does it tell me? I'm sure it was, 75, yeah, I was right. Um, but look, you've got, you've got fire, you've got carnage going on underneath. There's a big uh, oil refinery. Uh, down in the Thames estuary, Thames Haven in fact, oil tanks at Thames Haven ablaze, set ablaze by the bombing raid. Now later on all that got removed and again uh, I've got another three examples or maybe four actually this one where it's all whited out this area so you don't see the second ankle and of course um, as Roy Huxley commented in his book some people were silly enough to buy this kit or have it given them and say why aren't there three ankles in it, it says it's got three ankles in the picture you know, people are really crazy on this sometimes, but anyway. Um, but anyway, getting back to the, the sort of um, uh, genesis of the project with Leslie, they looked at, at what Airfix were doing and thought, well, we don't think these kits are particularly nicely moulded. They've got some great subjects, um, but they're not very appealing, uh, and they don't, they don't appeal to youngsters. Uh, they have to be painted, which puts a lot of youngsters off, so if you're under 10, it's probably a bit of a turn-off. And they wanted to appeal to kind of the existing modelers, but also appeal to the younger ones. And they were trying to walk this tightrope of not making the kits too toy-like. But they wanted them to be coloured, colour-coded plastic, which did work quite well on some and not so well on some others. Um, so obviously this particular one, we've got uh, two tones of brown. I don't know why they... Sometimes they have strange choices. Two tones of brown and then the pale blue. The pale blue is perfect. They've got that bang on. But why they went for this dark brown and light brown combo, I don't know. I think green and brown or green and grey would have been better for this kit. But the underside is the, is the right colour. Frankly, spot on, pretty much. Uh, and that, you know, that came on the market in 75 and people were just blown away by it. They sort of looked at this and thought, it's beautiful, it's so much colour, lots of appeal. Even, you know, when you're an older model, even if you're a model in your teens and beyond, you know, into your adult life, took one look at this and thought, that is a very attractive looking presentation of a Heinkel 111, isn't it? And people bought it just on the, the artwork alone. Now, the other thing that they did, which was, again, quite, um, quite groundbreaking, they... But all these kits, apart from the big ones, come with a, a stand, or, in the case of the armour, they come with a, a lovely little diorama. And again, this is now this is groundbreaking, because this wasn't being done by other manufacturers, you know. And they came with some figures as well. This was absolutely brilliant. A pocket money kit that was like, you know, when they came out, 25 pence. I mean, look at this. Now, what is there not to like there? That's uh, the artwork on the back, showing you a couple of Africa Corps German soldiers uh, with a, an African building it's got a shell hole in it over here very very dynamic um, and that's one of the milder ones quite frankly I mean that's a nice example I've got here actually it's just a, a really mint example um, although this is one of the later generations you can tell by the amount of white and the fact that there's no um, there's no window even the even the armor kits had windows in them as you can see on this T34 uh, and this is a later one, so this is dated, what have we got, bum, 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 bum. 86, that's one of the later generations, but very nice one. Here is an original, T34, and this one is dated 76, so there we go, that's definitely generation one, for the armour, that was the year the armour came out, I think. 
uh, came out a little bit later than the, the aircraft did. And you got a window in it, so you could see the plastic. And uh, you know, and this this particular one has got an even more sort of exciting-looking diorama, where the T-34 is crashing through some fencing, and you've got your Soviet soldier, his machine gun there, running acro across infantry in support. So there we have it. Um, and, and they also came with this, um, you know, nice colour coding, uh, colour callouts on the side to tell you exactly what you have to do. When you compare that to an airfix tank at the time, it's just box, black and white instructions. Again, I should draw your attention to the instructions. The instructions were very colourful as well. They always used to come uh, purple range, the basic range. They would also come with a purple instruction leaflet. So that you knew which one it was, and the orange range, etc., would have an orange instruction leaflet, and red for red, etc. Um, and it was very easy. You've got a quick uh, paint guide. You've got a uh, mini mini paint guide, as they called it. Um, so if you just wanted to paint a few elements of it, but not the whole kit, you could. But if you want to do it, it does tell you which colours to paint. And then you get these nice simple instructions. Very easy to follow, all on one piece of paper. And you know you could build that, and uh, even if you're ten, you can build that in an afternoon. Frankly, if you concentrate, no problem at all. So the, you know they had a lot of um, a lot of things going for them. It even included details about how to put transfers, as we used to call them, on the decals. <laughs> and it's really nice, you know. So you've got a, a very dynamic-looking box. You've got a very dynamic-looking instruction guide. A lot of fun, you know, and this was 25 pence. So this was coming out probably about 15 or 20 percent cheaper than the relevant ethics kit of its day. And people were looking at them and thinking, well, it's just better and it's cheaper, you know, it's very competitively priced. Really nice little kits, came with some nice, albeit minimalistic decals, which I'll try and put back if I can, carefully in there. Uh, I'm not doing a very good job of it, it's got to go back in there. Um, so, a classic case of what's not to like, you know, and they came onto the market in 72 uh, with this um, purple range of aircraft and then it started to roll out, then they went to the orange range, so we then had uh, the bigger aircraft coming along and I'm, I'm very lucky with this one, I've talked about this on the review, this is a Messerschmitt BF-110 and this is an original that is just totally moving, I've never seen a moment example of the orange range to be honest. Complete original artwork. It's dated 76, so that's definitely the original box for this particular one. That's when the, this generation came out. Somebody's nicely put some tissue in there. But again, you got the window, you get the full... Unfortunately, we've got some writing on there, but never mind. Uh, you get the full colour call out on the back, so you, you, you pick it up and it would be a complete presentation. These are the, these are the paints you need. You know, this is the, the history element of it. It's all done for you, and even if you don't want to paint, there you go, that's what it's going to look like if it's not painted at all. So a very, very visually attractive uh, bit of packaging, you know, and of course on the other side you get their adverts for all their other products saying what else you can buy next with your pocket money, lightning, mosquito, or maybe a fairy swordfish in this particular case. And there we have it. So, you know, frankly, in 1976, these were just stunning. Uh, and revolutionary really because nobody had seen such an, a well executed piece of packaging and presentation it was absolutely in a league of its own even if the plastic within wasn't as good as some of the kits you know um, so let's have a look at that let's just um, talk about the plastic let's have a look at a couple of examples let's talk let's have a look at this lovely Mitchell shall we uh, which is an original 75 yeah um, it's just, I'm not going to do a review now, I'm just going to sort of show you quickly uh, what we're talking about in terms of plastic and what you get within. So you get, you know, in this case, three sprues and three colours on this um, red range. Uh, a little bit more expensive, they were, they were about 75p. I think, I think it was about 25p to the original purple range. Something like 50-55p for the orange. And these were about 75 to 90p, from what I remember, on the red range. But, you know, you get... A really nice, um, I'm just going to put that behind to make sure we don't have any focus issue. There we go. You get a really nice uh, sprue, and of course, the, the beauty of Matchbox was that they were a bit softly moulded, yes, it's true, as you can see, but they had no flash, so you didn't have any clean up to do. And when you're 10, believe me, that is what you want. 
Ten year olds have not got any patience to do cleaning up. Not even the ones that are keen models, I don't think, generally speaking. Here again, we've got propellers, and this is a, a nice example here. This is an original kit from 75, and it's basically perfect, really. There's no, no faults with the sprues. They're always strong, the sprues as well. You didn't often get uh, the matchbox kits with bits coming off. Occasionally, actually, the Heinkel 111 was one of the weaker ones. They, that's quite frank having bits come off. But most of them didn't. They were just totally solid, really. Um, uh, and you know, you get a really a nice experience for your money, and then something that you can build in a day, basically, in most cases. Certainly, a, certainly a weekend, you build them no problem, even if you're not painting them. You know, they came with uh, interesting variants. So this one's got the uh, the 75 millimeter cannon. As you can see there, the hole for it, and the machine guns at the front. Full Browning, 50 cals, and a 75mm cannon. That's going to give somebody a really bad day. <laughs> and, you know, you've got three different colours. Uh, this particular choice of colours is probably slightly better than the uh, strange ones in the Heinkel, in fairness. <laughs> so there we go, there's three sprues. Then, of course, you get the lovely, uh, very, very uh, ubiquitous matchbox stand which really were very very good they were much more attractive than the very crude airfix one which a lot of the kits didn't come with anyway uh, and it was a very crude stand and they hadn't changed it for 20 odd years this came along and you've got a multi angleable with this uh, ball and cup arrangement so you you had again something else that they trumpeted on their packaging you know, you've got a stand that you can angle your aircraft at any, almost any angle within reason. Um, and that is not what the competition were doing, so it was unique. And that was another step forward, and something so small and simple as that. Um, and Airfix just couldn't be bothered doing that. Yeah, we've got clear parts, I won't take that out, but um, the clear parts are actually quite decent. Quite thick, in fairness, a little bit out of scale. Uh, it's certainly sound. But they were always pretty good, you know, quite decent. So. Am I getting a delivery? I might have to do a cut here, or not. No, we, no, it's no problem. It's okay. It's not. It's not a delivery for me. Not to worry. Not to worry. Now then, it's interesting. I've got this pad out because I wanted to share something with you that's very relevant. Oh yeah, the, uh, the day cars—they don't last so well. I've got to be honest. Ah. Um, I should also point out as well that on these bigger kits, uh, for some reason this one has arrived black and white, which is very curious, because that's normally red, uh, or as I say, orange for the orange range, purple for the purple range. But they did so it's like they ran out of ink or something, they did produce a whole load of them, even though they're originals. It's genuine, it's not a copy, it's a genuine original, but it's in black and white. But it, they make it more of a sheet rather than a pull out sort of folder booklet style. Um, but still, very, very clear. No problem at all, uh, and, and again you get this uh, even better sort of uh, set of colour callouts um, for all the small parts, which is really cool. Um, and there we have it. So I'm going to pop that back in there, if you'll just excuse me, because I do want to make sure that these go back where they belong. I want to talk to you about. If, it's, if it is arousing your interest in these kits, uh, a very, very good research, resource, I should say, you can go to on the internet and you'll find it very, very useful. Let me just um, pop this in there. another thing I quite like about these, you very rarely have a problem actually getting them back in the box. They normally go in with relative ease, he says. As soon as he says that, of course, it's bound to go wrong. And it has. <laughs> My own fault though, I'll just put them in a minute, to be honest. One of my videos wouldn't be the same if I wasn't putting things back in a box, would it? Right, pop that in there, pop that in there. Yeah. So, in we go with that. Ah! What have I forgotten? You're all watching and thinking, he's got the stand, he's got the stand. The vital stand, I'll just put that in there too alongside our clear parts, I think. We don't want to have, oh, it's broken off now. How did that happen? Oops. 
do this very well at all. It's all going so well. Uh, it doesn't help actually in this particular case, we've got a box that's a little bit, uh, it's a little, it's a little bit kinked at the back. Anyway, now then, resource information. Um, should have mentioned of course, they, they eventually came out with these uh, 30 second scale kits and these are the two best sellers that they had. So as you would imagine, it's the, uh, it's the Measure Spit 109, BF 109 and the Spit Flame 22-24. Uh, Spit Flame in particular I thought was an interesting choice because I'd never seen a Mark 22-24 Spit Flame before I saw this kit. And I really liked it. And you see, it is an elegant aeroplane, you know, and it's something a bit different. Um, the only disappointment is that it wasn't one used in Second World War. But actually, as a subject, I thought it was a good choice. Uh, and of course, the BF 109E, Adolf Gallant's plane, fantastic. Now, I have something here which I think people find interesting, excuse me, <coughs> especially if you're not aware of it. It is uh, a website called matchboxkits.org. Now, this is not an official website, it's not sanctioned by anybody, it's a group of enthusiasts. I'm not one of them, so I'm giving them a free plug in, which I don't mind at all, because I think they deserve it, frankly. What we have, he says, to give you maximum quality here, we can see it. We have got um, a resource where basically you can go into any sort of category, purple here, purple, here we go, let's just click, click on it. And then we get by year, so here you go, 1972, the very original, so 72 you've got the Hawk Fury, You've got the Spitfire Mark 9, the Boeing uh, P-12 and the Zero A6M, Alpha Jet, Fokker Wolf 190, the Lysander, the Gladiator, the Cobra, the Strike Master. That's actually 73, I'm 73 now. So yeah, once you get to the Gladiator, that's the first of the, no it's not, sorry. What's the first one? And they're a little bit mixed up here. So actually, according to this, the only one that's 72 is the zero, which I showed in my video the other week. And then they sort of march on through 1973 with the Corsair and so on and so forth. Interestingly though, the Nat, the Red Arrow Nat here, that's also 72 as the date, as is the Hellcat, of which I've got a really, really nice example, and the MiG-21, which I have no example. Which is a bit of a, a bit remiss of me, to be honest. I really think I should uh, correct that, to be honest. <laughs> um, because I did, I did have, I've had one. I've had the kit and I made it when I was a youngster. But uh, yeah, I, I really need to get a MiG-21. Because it's, again, it's got some nice artwork on it. So let's click on that one. Let's show you what it's like. I'm going a bit closer. So then you click on it. And it goes into giving you, you know, the kind of full history, really. Here we are. And uh, you can look at the artwork, see the box, and that's definitely a 72, isn't it? Because it's a, a top opening style box. So that's one of the very original style. And then you can look at their other photos. There's the back, yeah, you can see that's got no window on it. It's an original Mark I box. And then, <laughs> I thought this, this almost spoils it for me, because people do, some of them do a really beautiful job of it, but they almost do it too well, I think, for a matchbox. Um, ah, there we go. Now that's more, that's more my cup of tea. That's the way that I did it. So that's got no painting, it's just got the decals, the decals on. And that's somebody building it in the old school style, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it shows the sprues. It's all there, isn't it? It shows the sprues, all the contents of the box, and then the instructions. So, so it's really cool. Um, we go back. I'm going to just wind back and go to the orange range now and look at something different. Uh, let's take the, the Jaguar, shall we say. Jaguar. We click on that one and then we get, we get all our Jaguar artwork. BAC Jaguar. S Jaguar Strike. And then click on that says. For some reason it's not giving me the other artwork. I'm sure what's going on there. Let's go back. Yeah, here we go. Next. And then you get your your box art. So it's, it's just like when you've seen the reviews that I've done. You can see all the same 
and again someone's done it here uh, in the non-painted style and I just think that <laughs> not so much with the armour but certainly with the aircraft uh, there's some, some charm about these original matchboxes um, I think it's quite nice to do them unpainted I'm not suggesting you should uh, and it won't give you a very authentic looking model at the end of the day but it does recreate that feeling that you had of nostalgia from your child of just doing it that way which I quite enjoy so I often there we go look at that that's a great uh, that's a great poser I don't know if he's got a tail sitter there he hasn't got much weight in the nose but it's uh, zoom in a bit more it, that looks quite cool I think <laughs> almost like the uh, in the style of the artwork you know yeah <laughs> yes nice 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 Yeah, you get the idea, and then and again, it'll go into showing you the kit, and so that's that's nicely done, that kit actually, and that's totally unpainted, as it comes from the box. Yes, it doesn't look like an RAF one, but it, you could almost say it was a prototype, couldn't you? And you can see here that when I was talking about the orange instructions, etc. So this is this matchboxkits.org. Um, I think if you love Matchbox kits, I can strongly recommend this to you. I would uh, urge you to go and uh, maybe take a look at that and have a look at some of the work that these people have done. Uh, let's just have a look at some of the... Uh, go back again and look at some of the armour. in the uh, Orange range armour. Armour, armour, armour. Here we go. Let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at the Puma, for example. Another one that's very popular. Have a look at this one. Uh, here we go, this will bring back memories for a lot of you, I'm sure. <laughs> Myself included. And then we get this uh, street scene. There we go, somebody's done a really nice one there. <laughs> How cool is that? Well, I built one of these recently, but um, it was a kit I bought on eBay which actually came with no street. Somebody, somebody, somebody stole the street so I could play. I got my money back actually. Even though I offered to return it, it just refunded me and I ended up building it without the street scenes. That was a bit unfortunate, but um, can't complain because it's free. But that's nice. Various different examples, different... Yeah, that's a nice one. I've done that really well. So, you know, you get the idea. Um, and then we get onto the uh, aircraft. We'll go back to aircraft and we'll have a look at the Red Range. Perhaps have a look at, you know, the old Phantom. Now, what is not to like here? This is the original. Oh no, it's not the original paint. Uh, oh, but that's got that's got the white at the top. So I've got the I've got an example of the original, which you'll see on my review that I've done. Um, but again, some really nice uh, artwork showing the colour callouts on the back. Um, for some reason, this one doesn't have any other pictures. I'm going to assemble one. That's unusual. Let's try a different one. Different aircraft. Let's try the Mitchell Wellington Tomcat. Interesting. This is this is the original Tomcat with the blue, the full blue background. Which for some reason, mine doesn't seem to have. I've got the later one. But that is the original uh, blue background artwork, which is nice. And then there it is. Very very nice. It's a lovely uh, bit of art, isn't it? That one. For some reason I didn't get a chance to click on the other photo. So here we go, here we go. Right. Showing the uh, artwork on the rear. Here's an example of one that's been painted up and built. There's one that's not been painted. Again, a slightly, perhaps a slightly strange choice of, uh, of colours there from Matchbox. With the wings open and closed. Looking very cool. It's nice though, quite a Quite a decent looking kit, to be honest. A bit softly moulded. You do notice it more, the bigger it gets, the more softly moulded it seems to be. But, you know, nice. Very nice. And then let's have a look at some of this uh, armour, some of the bigger armour kits. I can find it. Yeah, then. 
orange armour. Here we go. This is where you get these sort of diorama sets. Here we go, the Willis, uh, sorry, the Morris um, truck, C8 Mark II truck, £17 a gun with a Willis Jeep to boot. There's plenty to go out in this set. And here you get really a very nice uh, diorama set. Driving through a town in what looks like Germany, late war. There's the finished example. Whoops. Yeah, that looks... Uh, that looks pretty nice, doesn't it? And these are very popular um, subjects. You still see them being built today, and of course, um, especially with this uh, armor range, you can pick these up. Um, they're reboxed. Most of these are by by Revel. So Revel are doing it, and you can always get your hands on one for a sensible price. They're not expensive either. Whereas with some of the other kits, I think like the Spitfire. Maybe the ME109, sure about that one. But you can certainly get the Spitfire reboxed by Ravel, but their prices have gone a bit stupid. You know, it's a retail of something from the mid 70s and they're charging, I think, 30 odd pounds for it, or something ridiculous. Anyway, so that is one there. Just that's if any other interesting ones that are worthy of a, a nosy. I think there is one, isn't there? That one. Here's another one that I've got. Uh, whoops. Perhaps I'll bring you in a bit more. Uh, this is the uh, the half track truck, and uh, again in North African trim. They did a lot of North African subjects actually on Matchbox, trying to be different to Airfix, I think. And again, looks really nice when it's made up. Got a broken down building with a pack uh, cannon on the back. It's a semi semi five mm cannon. And you've got troops on the back and the back of the truck. Really good stuff. Um, I think we'll just finally have a look at one of these um, green range, they're called. Go back to aircraft. Go to the green range, green. And then we've got these big scale kits like, you know, the ME109. Here it is. That we've just got here in front of us on the desk. Now then. How's that? Very, very nice. Lots of pictures showing the sprues. That looks really cool. I had mine in a very similar paint scheme to that. Complete with Adolf, Adolf Galland at the side. Really, you can make it into quite a nice diorama. I mean, again, it is a bit softly moulded, but you know, you can always get some resin parts. People do this and upgrade it. Just to say that you've built the Matchbox kit and it, it does look the part. A nice Battle of Britain ME109E for sure. Absolutely cool. Decals, instructions. It's all there. And then you get these nice paint colour plan, which is separate to the instructions, which I thought were really good. Um, I really like the way they did that actually. Put a lot of effort into it. And then you get all the, uh, the details of the breakout of the instructions in another big sheet again. And so on and so forth. And then you get the mini paint guys. So if you really are young and you don't want to paint it, you just want to paint some of the guns and things just to give a little bit of more realism for the components. There you have it. Colour plan. I didn't like that colour plan. It's really nice the way they did that. But again, obviously this, this is the one where people say, oh no, you... I've only got one kit in my box, there should be two. Goodness knows why I never think that, I don't know. I mean, you've got enough work with one, haven't you, really? <laughs> anyway. What are our thoughts on this? Um, I wanted to talk about... I'm going to close that down. I wanted to talk as well about what the expectations were once they'd come out on the market. You know, there were... There were a generation, uh, generations too strong a word, but a, a number of people that were used to more seriously, more soberly done kits perhaps. And you could argue that these are rather jazzy. Um, I personally liked it because I was, when they came out, I was seven. So it was absolutely perfect timing that these were introduced for me. Um, and I loved, I loved the whole concept of Matchbox and, and they just became my go-to kits. I stopped. 
I stopped buying Airfix kits. Not not completely, but 95% of what I bought was Matchbox. Um, I was going to ask this question and pose the question to other people. What is it that we expect from kits, really? I'm not talking about so much today. Or am I? Or am I? What is it that we really want when we buy a kit? Are, are we wanting an easy uh, way of building a model? Um, are we wanting a massive challenge? A not an easy way of building one. Uh, to prove how good we are. Some people do, and some people have to. Some, some of us, me included, have no choice. You, you buy something you think is going to be really good, and you find out it's a bit of a nightmare. And you've got a simple choice. You can either bin it, or you can... Uh, beat it into submission as we say and uh, fight it all the way because some of them do the beauty of matchbox and this is what i'm talking about with the trying to understand what everybody's different and everybody probably also has their expectations and uh, wants and demands change over time now i want a more more accurate more serious kit perhaps i mean i'm not sure that matchbox would Triumph today. I don't think they would be. They wouldn't work in the current market because things have moved on. You know, the world has changed. But you know, the tooling technology in the 1970s was not great, and given the limitations that there were, they did come up with some interesting subjects, and they came up with some really nice kits. They went together really well. They often didn't give you much in the way of seams, uh, panel line gaps weren't. They weren't too bad on that. Some were better than others, but. You know, the, the, the detail was where they fell down. They were a little bit soft, as I say. And some of them have, have got raised panel lines. Not many, but the ones you, that have got it, like the, uh, the 70 second scale Curtis P40, that was horrendous. But, yeah, um, given the, the time that these were released, I think that they were absolutely dynamite. I was a huge fan of them. Uh, I just can't get enough of it. And I'm sure many of you watching this are probably nodding in agreement. But it, as I say, it comes down to what you want. Do you want it to be an experience where you have an easy build? Somebody else was talking about this recently. They were saying, do you want an easy build and then you just want to get it finished as quickly as possible? Do you want an easy build but because, and this is probably me, because you want to get the basic canvas of, of the subject in a high quality form? built and then you paint on it it's not I wouldn't class myself as a painter but I like to add things I like to sort of make it unique um, I mean I did this with my uh, Tamiya 30 second scale Spitfire for example I did it in the markings of Charlie Fox uh, the Canadian pilot who shot up Field Marshal Rommel in Normandy you can't get even you can't even get a a decal set for him. I don't know why. It's strange to me. Uh, perhaps it's because historically it wasn't known about that he was the pilot that was responsible. And it only came out in the 70s after people did lots and lots of research. There was all sorts of confusion around the incident about who did what and everybody claimed it. Once they found out Rommel had been shot up, everybody that shot up a vehicle or a car that day claimed it was Rommel. So, and he didn't, ironically. He's the one that didn't make any claims and it was put to him later in life that the the evidence was kind of overwhelming when it was all cross-referenced. But anyway, I'm digressing. But I, I made that uh, a unique subject. And that's the kind of thing I like to do. I, I want to have the model as a canvas. I want, to, I want, it, I want it to be enjoyable. I, want, I don't want to fight it. Now, there are kits where you think, well, that's a terrible kit. I can prove to other people how great I am. You know? And we all do this, I think, from time to time. And it's very credible. It's good to do it. I mean, example, two examples I can think of. Three. Uh, in the good, the bad, and the ugly videos I did back in my uh, uh, 2020 uh, videos in November, as an alternative to going to the Telford Show uh, IPMS model scale model world, which was cancelled, I did these three videos, and uh, the, there was the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I did uh, my just purely not an extensive list, only my own experiences. But I, in the ugly section, I had the three real pigs, you know, and they were the Vulcan from Airfix, the, surprisingly, the uh, Eduard Mirage 3, which is just awful, <laughs> uh, had real nightmares of mine, it was every problem that has ever been mentioned in any of those kits, I got them all in one kit, and also the Airfix 48 scale Buccaneer. Now, Airfix are bringing out a new, and I'm sure it'll be a lovely one, uh, this summer it's coming out, so that, that old kit, they might as well just literally melt down the mould, the tooling, because it's just 
horrible and that fought me everywhere and the trouble is you can see that because it was such a battle just to get it assembled by the time we got to the painting stage I did a decent job of the painting but I didn't make any great effort with things like weathering or adding stuff and you know going the extra mile doing the oil washers and I just lost I just had such a battle I'd lost all interest in the thing just wanted it done and move on to something that was more enjoyable you know I mean I'm like a lot of people I'm, my parents are long gone sadly um, and it really when, when when they both died I actually thought about you know how we spend our time spend your time wisely you know I, I'm not suggesting anybody does the same as what I think and if you enjoy uh, overcoming and triumphing over these bad kits and I see people that do this and it, it amazes me it really does I'm full of admiration I don't know how they have the patience I just don't but for me personally I, I don't want that and I think in the 21st century, I think accepting bad kits is just not something I'm going to do. Uh, there's just no excuse with the modern technology that we have bad kits. Some better than others, sure. But some come out, and I'm, I'm talking to you, Ravel. Airfix have made one or two dogs, but a Ravel, if they've got a nasty habit of reissuing things and making you think it's new and it isn't. And that, that is a practice that is fraudulent, I think is the best most polite way of putting it. I don't think it's very honest and uh, not acceptable. You know, and in the 21st century, uh, at least Airfix they reissue an old kit and they tell you say, it's an Airfix classic, so it's, an, it's just a reissue. That's fine. Then we have a choice and we can look at them and say, ah, oh, I remember I did this. I made a terrible mess of it when I was seven. I'm going to have another go at it. And that's fine. You, you've got the choice. What you don't want is to think you're getting a new kit. Like so many people that bought that 48 scale, sorry, 32nd scale Harrier GR1 from Ravel. And it was a 50 year old kit. What a pig. I mean, uh, and they had new artwork and it looked like a new kit. And I was like two minutes away from purchasing that when I was at Scale Model World myself. And I, I just got, I just got a bad feeling about it. I just got, mm -mm, I'm going to check it out. I'm not going to buy it and be too precipitous or spontaneous on the day. And I'm glad I didn't because everybody that's built it tells me it's awful. Because uh, it's not new, it's really old. Anyway, if you're going to build a 50 year old kit, my advice would be, build one of these, because you'll enjoy the experience. It will go together pretty well, you know. Yes, they occasionally need a little bit of filler here and there, but the actual fit, they will go together, you know. You're not going to battle it just to get it assembled. You might need to refine, you know, if there is an odd panel line or a little, maybe a small gap here and there. But you'd be surprised by how good they are. They really are quite nice kits. Um, and, of course, in this original form that we've got around me here, they're, you know, they are quite hard to get hold of. Um, and I am, as someone who's got a cl big collection of these, I've got about 120 of these originals, and 90% of them are in really mint boxes. I mean, this one looks like it's, it's almost so good, it's almost like a repro box, but it's not. It is original, it's got the original tape mark on it. Um, I wouldn't be building that. You know, that, I'd be crazy to build that. If you want to build one of these matchbox, and many of you will, I'm sure, that that are watching and perhaps it's, maybe, maybe I can reignite some enthusiasm for them if you already have the spark I can maybe make it into a flame <laughs> but go, go and buy them from the Ravel Rebox because especially on the armour they're still quite cheap you can get T-34 and the Panzers and the Sherman Firefly and the Puma and all that stuff you can get them fairly cheaply uh, and it's the same the only thing that is different is the instructions and the colour of the plastic, which will just be a single colour, I'm afraid. But I built the uh, the T34, I showed it off in one of my recent videos um, in November. When I was, put, uh, I think it was entitled, What's Your Favourite Kit? And I did I had the T34, and that was the Ravel version. <laughs> so that was actually from the Ravel box. And the Ravel box is worth it, just toss it away. But when I have built, the other one of these I have built, um, of an original example like we have around me here, I always keep the box because the box is irreplaceable. Uh, the plastic can always be restamped, uh, but they're not going to reprint an original Matchbox uh, box ever. So don't throw your boxes away. If you do build an original Matchbox, keep the box. My advice: keep the box. Um, buy yourself another one, uh, Revell, and just put the kit. Get rid of the Revell box. Just chuck it in the bin and keep the Matchbox box and instructions and put your kit all back together in there and if you ever do decide to sell it on eBay just tell people you know I think that people will really appreciate that it's the next best thing to an original classic like I've got around me uh, which are hard to get hold of and getting very very pricey but that's a nice halfway house you've got the original box you've got the original instructions 
and as a collector I would rather appreciate that certainly better than than just having the Ravel in the Ravel box you know and some people do sell matchbox boxes would you believe um, I, I've seen a couple I think I bought one I don't think which one it was I've got one somewhere that's that's put aside it might be the lightning or I'm sure I bought a matchbox box that was said to be in mint condition, it was. Um, because somebody has obviously built the kit and then thinks it's too good to throw away, I'll charge three, four pound for the box. It's probably worth it. It's probably money well spent because if you've got a really dog eared box, I mean, I've got that Mitchell one's a little bit battered, but that's so original that that doesn't really matter. But if you've got one of the cheaper kits, the purple range, and it's really hammered, it's sat on or something, you know, replace the box three or four pounds because it'll pay you back. The value that if you ever sell that original genuine article kit, if it's in a genuine article box, uh, you probably pay four pound for the box. You probably added about ten pound in value to the actual kit, and they change hands these for striking money really. So things like the uh, the tank kits uh, that would change hands typically for about twelve to fifteen pounds plus postage. The orange range these are changing hands for around about the twenty five to thirty pounds. Um, purple range, you know, like your beautiful Wellington original one here, 30, 35, 40 pounds, no problem. And then similar price for, I'm t I'm, when I'm giving these prices, I'm talking premium mint here. If they are a bit hammered, they'll be a bit less than that. And then you've got a couple here that are mint, you know, these are going to be 40 to 50 pounds to get your hands on one of those. So, it's worth it, you know, the box, don't, don't overlook the box because people like it to be a complete package. They're not sort of coded or anything, the box and the instructions. It's not like a car with a VIN number. As long as it is a genuine, the correct box for the correct kit, it's worth buying a box. So there's a tip. Anyway, in my next instalment, we're going to talk a bit more. We'll show some others. Um, I know I didn't sort of get them out, but I think you know the form. I'll show you a bit more before I go. I know you think you need to open them. Right now. <laughs> um, oh, forgive my um, anti-moisture gel packs, which I think are quite important in these older kits. Look at the beautiful presentation they came with. They have a, a separator here. Um, you know, you've got your um, clear parts. You've got your in instructions and your your colour guide over here, which we just talked about, of course. That one out. Colour plan. There it is. Great stuff, you know. It's fantastic, isn't it? You know. You open it up and you are back in 1976. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and arguably these bigger ones are perhaps perhaps they didn't make quite as much effort with the packaging as they did on the early ones. But you were still getting quite a lot of kit here for not a lot of money. I mean, what did I say they were? Um, I think these were changing hands for about... Um, Something like four pounds, eighty-five pounds. Back when they first came out, I'm talking quite quite a lot, um, and they were, you know, like three, four times the price of perhaps a Red Range kit. Was it less than that? I think I might be exaggerating. That. I, I have a memory of these going up to about one pound twenty-five, and I thought this was about four pounds seventy-five. These back in seventy-six. Perhaps somebody will correct me if I'm wrong there, but thereabouts. Thereabouts. It was under five pounds, I think, but there were a lot more money. Um, but they weren't as much as a, an Airfix 24 scale kit, which was probably going for about ten pounds at that point. Um, nine or ten pounds, quite a lot of money then. Um, and you got you got all this colour, and you got you know, your dad would say, well, you can wait until your birthday, or you know, end of the month I'll get you one of these, and it was like, I'll, I'll have one of these, thanks. <laughs> no hesitation at all. Um, and as I say. Uh, they've got such such charisma, haven't they? Charisma, I think that's a good word for these these kits. What do you think? What's your favourites? Um, is there any, any that you'd like me to review? I haven't got them all. I haven't got them all. There's quite a number of Matchbox kits. I really bought the kits that excited me. So they're mainly aircraft, they're mainly an armour. Uh, I haven't got any cars. Um, don't think so. Not Matchbox cars, no. Um, and I did, did have one ship, but I think I built it, but I've got none, none now. So no ships, no cars, and no motorbikes. But if any of you would like me to just dig out for the next instalment, any particular ones, um, shout up. Uh, if you want me to open one of these and go through it in a bit more detail, I don't want to do full reviews because we've done that already, but if you'd just like to see a bit more, 
shout up and make a comment below don't don't be shy and uh, I'll try and accommodate you next time we'll have a look at some uh, some other different ones we'll have a look at some perhaps some of the orange armor kits um, some of the later ones as well that I have maybe the ones I haven't built show you one or two of those I'll just have a talk about again talk about the values of the various things and I'll have a look on eBay and see what they're actually trading hands for uh, the particular ones that I'll talk about next time um, and uh, just show you some more nostalgic matchbox kits to uh, take you back to the uh, the good old days of the mid 70s really anyway I hope you enjoyed it today found it interesting please give us a like if you haven't already with a thumbs up at 10 out of 10 <laughs> and uh, don't forget if you haven't subscribed please do so because you'll see a lot more of this stuff uh, I say I'm probably going to do three of these I think showing you a variety of them uh, and I'll try and get out some perhaps some more of the smaller aircraft next time that a lot of you will have had perhaps as your first kit my first one I think was the was it the Spit? I can never remember if it was the Spitfire or maybe the Brewster Buffalo or something like that anyway we'll have a look at those uh, yeah and have a good old nosy and perhaps um, what else have we got we've got the Phantom I've got the Phantom and I think on the Red Range what the others were Tomcat we've got there uh, there's a good selection. We'll, we'll, we'll get a few of them out and have a bit of a nosy and see what we've got. Look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Don't forget to ding the notification bell to get a reminder when that video comes available. And if you've got any input or comment to make, please feel free, as I say, either live now in the live chat or please, if you don't catch it live, uh, I'll read every comment, every single one, every time. I usually uh, will give you a thumbs up if it's a nice comment and, uh, and I'll perhaps comment or... Uh, we can have a chat that way, it's very interesting to hear what other people's thoughts are, which ones they did and how they did it. And uh, have a look on the matchboxkits.org website, you'll find it very interesting and uh, it's quite evocative and nostalgic in its own right. So I should really contact these people and join them really, I'm, it's not a bad plan is it? But uh, anyway, there we go. Till next time, thanks a lot, uh, take care of yourselves, be, be, be safe, be well and bye for now.